Book Club is back. We've got a modern classic this time. Tom Wolfe's The Right Stuff, one of my favorites. It, the book came out in 1979 and won the National Book Award. It was made into a movie starring Ed Harris, Sam Shepard. And here with me are the book club regulars, Flora Lichtman, the multimedia editor, and uh, Ned Heist, our senior producer. Welcome. Hi, Ira. Welcome. One of, one of the reasons I love this book so much is because I actually met the man with the right stuff, uh, General Chuck Yeager, years ago and spent time with him when the first shuttle launch. Yes, uh, back in I've like heard. <laughs> 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 and I understand the general is on the line with us right uh, now. Wh- was that on the first shuttle landing on the lake bed out there? It sure was. Remember that? I co- remember that very much. Uh, you all were hyping about how, how great it was to land on a lake bed. And I said, hell, we've been landing on this lake bed for 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> there we were in our little card table. And I remember the... So I, I, I remember the uh, Secretary of the Air Force driving by to shake hands with you, and we had a great time. Yeah, yeah, it was fun. What, what, let's, talk about the, let's talk about what has happened in, in those years um, and, and about the right stuff. How, how, how much did the book get, get you as a real person, your personality and who you are? Did yeah, they... I, I think it did, it did a good job the, when, uh, when they re- re- wrote the book. You know that, that clarified a lot of stuff that came out in the movie, and uh, it 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 was fun uh, doing it. And I think, uh, like Sam Shepard, he was a perfect guy to to portray me. Uh huh. It, it, it worked out pretty good. How do you how do you define the right stuff? What does that term mean to you? Uh, nothing. <laughs> that answer your question. I guess if you have the right stuff, that term means nothing. Well, basically. Uh, the, that's just a, you know, basically a, a phrase that Tom Wolf coined that sold books, and that's about as simple as you can put it. Mm-hmm. It's it's uh, 65 years this year since you broke the sound barrier. Boy, that time must fl- have flown by very quickly for you. Yeah, it was. Uh, I did uh, on exactly on the anniversary. Uh, I uh, went over to Nellis Air Force Base in Las Vegas and borrowed a, an F-15 from them. And came back to Edwards and boomed the place and, uh, to commemorate uh, the anniversary. So I still fly quite a bit. General Yeager, this is Annette Heist. I'm um, senior producer for Science Friday, and I want to ask you about a part in the book. Tom Wolfe describes how every airline pilot in America sounds the same when they come over the intercom, when you're sitting on the plane, a particular draw, a particular folksiness. And he says that they've all gotten that voice from you. Is that true? Well, I, I don't know. Tom Wolf says it is. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> no, it's basically a lot of guys, a lot of the pilots out there at Edwards, test pilots mainly, kind of pick up the down-home phrase, you know, like the odd phrase that Sephora Pahar, they had to pipe daylight to me in West Virginia. <laughs> so uh, I, I don't have, I don't, I don't, Speak the king's language very good. What What do you think about uh, the the way pilots don't fly planes these days? I mean, we now have drones. We, they're, they're not the pilots sit oh, at joysticks. Hey, that, that's technology. You know, 50, 60 years ago, we just used fifty caliber bullets. Like I, like I flew Mustangs in World War II against the Germans, and uh, basically we. It's it, it's it's a it's a matter of progress and. Uh, Today, uh, uh, everything is done in airplanes is done with missiles, and uh, it takes takes all the training away and makes it pretty easy to shoot a guy down in front of you. Hmm. Our number is one eight hundred nine eight nine eight two five five. We're talking about uh, Tom Wolfe's book on our book club, uh, The Right Stuff, and we're talking about the man who is uh, the star of the of the Right Stuff, uh, General Chuck Yeager. What uh, are you going to continue to fly, General? And keep going on and continue to fly or do you think of retiring anytime soon uh no i i uh i still fly uh and uh, i'll be here in another couple months i'll be 90 years old but uh, basically i don't have any problem passing the physical so how much time did uh tom will spend with you for this book how much time did tom will spend with you for the book hey, tom quite a bit really uh when we got into the technical stuff we're where I was had an accident uh, spinning an airplane in and bailing out of, it, out of it, it was hard to make him understand really what you have to go through to 
to bail out of an airplane, and he he's he's not a technical guy, but he's a very good writer. Yeah, that part appears at, I think it's the last chapter, he closes the book with that amazing scene. It sounds it was. terrifying. I knew you were coming on today, so I knew, I knew what happened, that you're obviously alive, but my heart was pounding. Well, basically, uh, you got to expect things like that. I've bailed out uh, three times now, got shot out, and uh, then had, uh, re- had a problem when I re-entered the atmosphere above 100,000 feet with the NF-104. And uh, those are the things that you have to train yourself and also know the, your, your, your equipment, like your ejection seats, your pressure suits, and things like that. And, and uh, you know, I didn't just jump in an airplane and take off fly. <laughs> I tell you, I knew exactly what I was doing. This is Science Friday from NPR. I'm Ira Plato with Annette Heist and Flora Lickman talking with uh, General uh, Chuck Yeager, who uh, 65 years ago broke the sound barrier. You, uh, and the, according to the book and according to history, you had to keep that secret, did you not? The Air Force didn't release the fact that we had exceeded the speed of sound, you know, for a few months. And basically, it, that was good because what it did, it had let us develop flying tails on our fighters. Uh, And it took the British and the French and the Soviet Union, you know, about five years to solve their problem with flying tails. And uh, we we did it in the old days, and because that was our job. Did uh, there was fear at that point? And uh, what were you feeling as you got close to Mach one and got close to the sound barrier? What might happen? Hey, you're you're busy. (laughs) 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 What do I do next? Uh, You really don't have any. (laughs) <laughs> any feeling at all, but you just, you know, that's your job, and you do it. Mm-hmm. And 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 uh, you did it very well. And and were you were, were you disappointed about not getting the uh, the acclaim you might have had if you'd done something like this today or years uh, ago? No, basically, what I was doing. There's one word that's described. That's duty. I was a military pilot. I had a job to do, and I did it. And, uh, you know, they, they blow a lot of the crap out of shape today, like, you know, on a NASA program. Man, they, it was really, I was just thinking back on the first shuttle landing on the lake bed when I was sitting there with, was it Ira? That's me. Oh, okay. Do you remember that? I certainly do. Okay. You know, <laughs> I said to myself, <coughs> I said to myself, you know, we, time has passed. I wonder how many trillions of dollars NASA has wasted since that first landing. That's my attitude. Still your attitude? Has NASA wasted a lot of money, do you think? Yes, a lot of money. Because? Because? Well, that, that, it was easy. Yeah. It, like the last, I think the last three guys that walked on the moon, it, you know, it was a waste of money. Should we go? Should we not waste money going to Mars? Do you think? Uh, I, I, I not only will say yes, I'll say hell yes. <laughs> well, General Rieger, I want to ridiculous. You know, yeah. you, how long does it take you to get there? What do you? We've already got rovers on Mars. We know what it is, and uh, why it'll take what four months to get a guy there, yeah. uh, and it's. To me, it's a pretty, pretty bad waste of time and money. Well, General Yeager, I want to thank you very much for taking uh, time to be with us today. Congratulations on the 60th, 65th anniversary of breaking the sound barrier. And we yeah, I'm lucky enough that I still get to fly. And, and uh, in fact, I was on that day that on the anniversary, I was flying an F-15 down at Edwards. So. Yeah. Well, well. Many more years. We'll talk to you later. Thank you very much, and good luck to you. General Chuck Yeager, first man to break the sound barrier, one of the central characters in The Right Stuff. That's what we're talking about on our Sci-Fi Book Club. If you'd like to talk about it, 1-800-989-8255. You can also tweet us at Sci-Fi. Stay with us. We'll talk more about The Right Stuff right after this break. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Flato. If you're joining us, we're right in the middle of a break from our, our book club. Our uh, book club today, we're talking about the right stuff. And if you're just joining us now, you just missed a really interesting conversation with book General, club highlight. General Chuck Yeager. You can catch it on a podcast later. Uh, and uh, 
He has never been afraid to say what's on his mind. He, he told us when he went, when we, he, you know, he sort of said that NASA was a waste of money, but he wanted us to make sure he called back and said, I don't mean all of NASA. The unmanned stuff is great. Make sure you, you know, <laughs> your unmanned stuff is great. And you can, you can follow Chuck Yeager on his website. It's chuckyeager.com, right? right? And he, in the book, he's a central figure. He is. Well, how cool to have um, one of the characters from the book you're reading at your book club. <laughs> <laughs> I feel overwhelmed. <laughs> he is, a, he is a, a man of few words, but when he says them, he says them. Right? Well, I like that part about the right stuff. What does the right stuff mean to him? Nothing. I mean, the thing that seems to me brilliant about Tom Wolfe's book is the way he constructs it. So he opens it up and he's like, I'm curious. What makes, you know, an astronaut an astronaut? And then he says, no one will talk about it. He says, this quality, this it was never named. It wasn't talked about in any way. That's that's from the book. And then, you know, of course, you feel privy to this secret club where Tom Wolfe tells you what it is, what the right stuff is. In, in a lot of different ways, he tells you what the right stuff is. I think there are a lot of ways to interpret that. And I thought that was one of the most interesting parts about the book. How so? Um, well, for these, for the Mercury Seven, the, the right stuff was be a man, um, be a white man, be patriotic, at least have that appearance that you were a uh, family oriented, happily married, and um, toe the line is the right stuff in in a lot of ways. Yeah, to be an astronaut. Yes, to be an astronaut, which was different from. What Chuck Yeager was a doing. flyer, a, f- a pilot, a, a pilot. pilot, yeah, a pilot. Pilot yeah. is not spam in a can. Monkeys can't do what pilots right. do. You know, the, the fight about just putting a, a a window in the space capsule uh, because we're pilots should see something. Right, the very know. first one, the very first Mercury capsule had no window. Yeah. Can you imagine going up? To they they, fi- they I can't they, imagine <laughs> going up with with a yeah, window. Right. Or window. <laughs> well, spending a. <laughs> Spending six hours like Alan Shepard did, waiting to get launched. <laughs> I love in a, the in a phone booth. <laughs> the insight that Tom Wolf gives us into the minds of the astronauts when they're waiting on the launch pad to go, you know, to get popped off with the top of a champagne bottle, the cork, and he, you can only imagine the fear. And he's, no, really, they're thinking about, um, I really need to use the bathroom, or one of them fell asleep. It's just this amazing look inside the capsule it makes you feel like you're in there. Yeah. And and he has such detail in the book that you wonder if Tom Wolfe was really actually in some of the situations, he says. You you, you were reading before a, a spot about the, uh, the, someone's face in such detail. Right. How so, could he have been um, there? Tom, this is a part of the book where um, John Glenn is meeting Joe Kennedy, um, the father of President Kennedy, in the White House. And Joe Kennedy had a stroke, and Tom Wolfe is describing this. And he's he's describing Joe Kennedy's face, and he says that his eyebrow is curling down over his eye the way it does when you're when you're really bawling, and the tears are streaming out of the crevice where his eyebrow and his eye and his nose come together, and one of his nostrils is quivering, and his lips are writhing and contorting on that side, and his chin is all pulled up and pitted and trembling, and you could it seems like you could only write that if you were standing right there looking at the man, but he wasn't there, so it it. This is the style of the book. It, it, it's literary journalism, the new journalism, where he uses these literary techniques that tells a fact-based story. Yeah, it's 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 interesting to read because there are no quotes, unless they come from speeches. Yeah, yeah. it's all sort of through the lens of. But it's such, Tumult but lens. it's such great storytelling. It's it is. great. A, it seems what, like he's there in every scene. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I wonder what he. W- what he would do if he were to rewrite the book today? Would he write it the same way? Would he? Would people demand to have quotes? And mm. you know, yeah, would, it, would, would, would it be different? Or um, are we so just enamored with the first seven astronauts that you know? Even even in the when we went to the moon, people got tired after Apollo Apollo thirteen was the big one that, you know, never made it to the moon. And people were yawning already by that time, and they had more moon missions to go. I think it would be a totally different story today because of um, it seems like the press agreed to go along with the story in a lot of ways, that these were happy family men. And none of their, none of the extracurricular activities, shall we say, that are alluded to in the book 
came out well, that, during that time. Yeah, that's tr- true of the whole Kennedy administration. Right. There was no TMZ.com, you know, yeah. where they were going to get the dirt and it was going to be up on, on the Could And that's an internet. interesting question. Could these astronauts have remained as squeaky clean as they were? Although we did see in the book the bars they went to, the things that they did in their spare time that showed a little bit of the other side. Yeah, of for some lives. of them. Yeah, for some of them. Um, one eight hundred ninety nine eight two five five. If you would, if you'd like to uh, join us on a conversation, um, let's see if we get some uh, tweets or phone calls in. A lot of p- people would like to talk to to General Yeager, but he's not here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, you, you missed that. But uh, let, let, let me see if we get a call or two about him. Let's go to Parker in uh, Gainesville, Florida. Hi, Parker. Hi there. Hi. How are you? Hi. Great to talk to you guys. Thank you. Have you got a question for us? Well, I have a comment. Um, my grandfather's name is Seymour Rosing, and he was a test pilot for Bell Laboratories on the X-1 project. Um, he was the guy that they dropped off the bottom of the uh, the big plane and had to land the X-1 as a glider with no engine. Um, later on in the prog- process, um, a gentleman named Slick Goodwin, who was the lead pilot for, for Bell Laboratories, uh, was flying the X-1 in a test, and as he passed over the, uh, the area where all the scientists were, they heard a loud bang, but no one really knew what it was. So my grandfather's contention is that Slick uh, broke the sound barrier several years before uh, General Yeager did, and uh, when the Air Force uh, took it over, of course, for public relations, uh, they, they, they had General, General, General Yeager um, as the man in the record books. Um, not to take anything away from General Yeager, he's a great pilot and a, and a credit to uh, the pilots in history. Um, but he may not have been the one that broke the sound barrier. Has, do you know, has he ever been asked about this? Um, there, they, there have been conversations. I know my grandfather was talking with Katie Kirk for a little while about doing a story, but it kind of fell flat. But uh, Seymour Rosing is still alive, and, and uh, you know, he's a... I'm really proud of my grandfather. I, I, I think it's a cool thing to, to be that part of history. That's 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 interesting. It's, it's uh, too bad we couldn't have gotten them both on the show. <laughs> yeah. The book. Yeah, the, did, did did your grandfather read the book? Do you know if he read the right stuff? He did. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know he's probably not Mr. General Yeager's biggest fan. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm. I'm I'm sure they they knew. You know, we have people tweeting. Uh, wanted me to ask General Yeager if they could pass him a Beeman's. You know, that line from the movie about the gum. And um, mm-hmm. I wonder if that some of those little details really happened. Thank thank you, Parker, for you know. Send us a little note about that. Maybe we could follow up. I'd love to. Yeah. That's Thanks that's, for having me on. You're welcome. Have a have a good weekend. That's what's great is about we're contemporary historians and people <laughs> call up, right? And they add a little bit to the history. And, you know, and one of my favorite parts about a history is that just when you think you found the first person, there's always the third person who comes up who's the first. And I have a history question for you, yes. Ira. So the way this, this time period is described, people are just in love with the astronauts and sort of riveted by the story. It was Was that... Your experience yes, covering yes. it? Yes, because this was a time of uh, when the Kennedys were in the White House, and, the, and they used to call this period Camelot. You know, this mm. was the Camelot because this was the perfect first family, where records made about the first family, comedy records, and people were in love with the Kennedys. Mm-hmm. I, well, a great population was in love with the Kennedys. They only won by the squeakiest of, you know, 50, maybe a few hundred thousand votes over Richard Nixon. But there was a, a new period in Washington of just being in love with the Kennedys. There's a part of the book where they, uh, the he talks about one of the astronauts, I forget which one, goes to the White House and gets to meet the president and first lady. And I don't know if this is true, um, but when that person comes back, the first question that the astronaut astronaut wives have is tell us all about Jackie. Right. Yes. That's what they wanted yes. to know about. Jackie gave us all a tour of the White House. On t- I think it was Charles Collingwood on CBS. Gosh, I'm going way back in the <laughs> way back machine <laughs> way here. Back. Um, but that so that whole era and and the space race and the, the ability to to basically have the technology and the know-how to do whatever we'd like to do or we we could do it you know we and, and the whole idea of, of this space period covering a decade through different administrations something we think about big projects now that would never last now back then you know it started out with Kennedy went through Johnson went through through Nixon 
and they uh, and to think that that people could either get so tired of it in that short period or run out of money because of the Vietnam War that we just canceled the last three moon missions. We yeah. just canceled, you know. Have we seen excitement about science in that way since? I think the I think the Mars rover the stuff, rover stuff, you know. Yeah, you yeah. that was really that. exciting. It's exciting. Yeah. It's exciting now that curiosity is on Mars and you're wondering to watch that landing. What's that scoop of dirt going to show in it? We <laughs> keep hearing something's going to be yeah. coming from it, but but uh, I think I think people in space, manned space, uh, in those pioneering days, it was really it was really nothing like it. Mm. Um, even though people are in the International Space Station, we never hear anything about that. That's that's sort of old hat, and we take it for granted. But um, we had great heroes like Chuck Yeager, and we had comic books about them, and TV shows, and things. Things were you know lost in space. Was it t- was it the TV show? People were interested. Everything about space was, you know, the Space Needle was created mm. in that time in Seattle. Anything that had a space theme to it, the, the Jetsons, stuff it's like that. It was the future, yeah. It, w- it was the future, and maybe someone will write a book about or a, a hundred ab- uh, about those. What did, were you, now you did not live through, what did you think about that, Flora? The, was that captured enough for you in, in the book? It came think? through it, as a really exciting time. It It made me nostalgic for something I never experienced. <laughs> Um, and I, you know, one thing that I was interested in as as a modern follower of the space program was how the scientist, the science, sort of got snuck into the astronaut program. So you see that the origins of astronauts and these pilots, and this divide between pilot yeah. and astronaut, and then science sort of sort of creeped in, and there, and Scott Carpenter, right, was mm-hmm. the the astronaut you who know? sort of did a little science, but was people sort of turned up their nose at that idea. Well, what's really interesting about the space race, uh, starting with Sputnik is that it really was not a, about science. It was the whole thing was about technology. You know, the, the, the German scientists who were all scientists came from, from Germany from the war, the V2 rockets, and some of them came to the U.S., Werner von Braun, and some of them went to the, to the Soviet Union, and they were basically German scientists playing with each other again. Um, and that was, you know, that was just technology. We, did, we, we knew how to get into space. We knew how to put rockets up there and let's make better technology. Some of the science that happened was James Van Allen, one who looked at the, you know, the Sputniks, who looked at the, uh, our own, our own uh, satellite and noticed there was a radiation belt. Mm. There was real science. That was science. Finally, some science was happening that came out of the space race. Talking about uh, the right stuff and, and all kinds of trails <laughs> <laughs> leading in different directions. With the book club. Uh, on the book club on Science Friday from NPR. So this book was written 33 years ago, Flora. Do you think it holds up? I was reading a criticism of it mm-hmm. in The Guardian. We're not going to mention any more of that. But what do you think about the writing style? Oh, I, I mean, I thought that it was masterful. I thought the writing was really... Uh, really mm-hmm. masterful. Mm-hmm. Let's go to the quick, see if we can get a quick phone call in before we have to go. Phil, in, uh, is it Clark, Wyoming? That's correct. How are you doing? I'm sorry. I uh, Actually, I want to make a comment. I, I haven't read the book, but uh, I saw the movie, and I was very disappointed in one respect. I went through, uh, started Navy flight training in 1962, and I had the great good fortune to uh, have both Ed White and Gus Grissom in my uh, helicopter ground school. I thought the movie portrayed Gus Grissom as sort of a whining buffoon, mm-hmm. and he was anything but. He was a highly intelligent man. He was funny. He was a class cut-up. He would. Uh, I was a cadet, and he would sneak occasionally cadets into the officers' club, which was pretty much against the rules, but he would do it. Um, but he was anything but portrayed in that movie. He was. He was a fine man, very intelligent. Uh, uh, knew more about aerodynamics than any other 10 people I ever knew. Mm. And uh, that is something that's been stuck in my crawl since 19, or since the movie came out, and uh, wow. I'm glad to have a chance to, to air myself. Well, what so a, thank what, you for taking my call. You mm. know, well, what a personal tragedy this must have been for you with Apollo 1 then. When, the when, when uh, both of those yeah. men were killed, it was, a, it was a personal tragedy, and it was a great loss for the program. Uh, uh, Ed White was uh, um, He's a much quieter, more uh, low-keyed individual than Gus Grissom was, but uh, he was extremely sharp, uh, as sharp as a military man and sharp in, the, in his knowledge of aerodynamics and just basic uh, flying mm-hmm. knowledge. And he was, they, they were both terrific men, but Gus, Gus Grissom was, uh, I think he, it was a great dishonor the way he was portrayed in that movie. I don't know how he was portrayed in the book because 
I didn't read the book, but mm. the movie did him a great dishonor. Well, I'm glad we could give you an opportunity to uh, get it off your chest all these years. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. You're welcome. And I'm enjoying your program. Thank you very much, and have a good weekend. Thank you. You too. Mm-hmm. Bye-bye. Book was not terribly kind to Gus, was Mm-mm. it? Mm-mm. Well, he was the second to go in the capsule. That's, is that right? Mm-hmm. And he lost. The capsule was lost. There, there were... A, there were a lot of phraseolo- phraseologies that came out of the book. They said he screwed the pooch with something. We also had the right stuff came into the vernacular. What other pushing kinds of... Pushing the Pushing the envelope. envelope came into the vernacular. All kinds of stuff that uh, we take for granted. Probably people don't even know where it came from, came from the book. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, well, have we got a choice for our next book club? Not yet. <laughs> Send your submissions. Comment on our page. And, and it's going to be hard to top having... General Jaeger, yeah, <laughs> main character from the book. <laughs> Send your suggestions and your guest suggestions yeah. too. F one hundred four, and uh, those are the things that you have to train yourself and also know the, your 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 equipment, like your ejection seats, your pressure suits, and things like that. And and uh, you know, I didn't just jump in an airplane, take off, fly. <laughs> I tell you, I knew exactly what I was doing. This is Science Friday from NPR. I'm Ira Plato with Annette Heist and Flora Lickman talking with uh, General uh, Chuck Yeager, who uh, 65 years ago broke the sound barrier. You, uh, and the, according to the book and according to history, you had to keep that secret, did you not? The Air Force didn't release the fact that we had exceeded the speed of sound, you know, for a few months. And basically, it, that was good because what it did it let us develop flying tails on our fighters, uh, and it took the British and the French and the Soviet Union, you know, about five years to solve their problem with flying tails. And uh, we we did it in the old days and because that was our job. Did, uh, w- there was fear at that point, and I'm, uh, what were you feeling as you got close to Mach 1 and got close to the I, sound barrier? What no, might happen? Hey, you're, you're busy. <laughs> <That's about laughs> the of, and what do I do next? <clears throat> you really don't have any <clears throat> any feeling at all, but you just you know that's your job and you do it. Mm-hmm. And 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 uh, you did it very well. And and were you were, were you disappointed about not getting the uh, the acclaim you might have had if you'd done something like this today or years uh, ago? No, basically what I was doing. The, there's one word is it's described. That's duty. I was a military pilot. I had a job to do, and I did it. And uh, you know, they they blow a lot of the crap out of shape today. Like you know, on a NASA program, man, they it was really. I was just thinking back on the first shuttle landing on the lake bed when I was sitting there with was it Ira? That's me. Oh, okay. You remember that? I certainly do. Okay. You know. <laughs> I said to myself, <coughs> I said to myself, you know, we time has passed. I wonder how many trillions of dollars NASA has wasted since that first landing. That's my attitude. Still your attitude? Has NASA wasted a lot of money? Do you think? Yes, a lot of money. Because? Because. Uh, well, that that it was easy. Yeah. It, like the last, I think the last three guys that walked on the moon, it, you know, it was a waste of money. Should we go? Should we not waste money going to Mars? Do you think? Uh, the, I, I, I not only will say yes, I'll say hell yes. <laughs> well, General Rieger, I want to ridiculous. Th- you know, yeah. you tell you, how long does it take you to get there? What do you? We've already got rovers on. Mars, we know what it is, and uh, why it'll take what four months to get a guy there, uh, yeah. and it's it, to me it's a pretty pretty bad waste of time and money. Well, General Yeager, I want to thank you very much for taking uh, time to be with us today. Congratulations on the 60th, 65th anniversary of breaking the sound barrier. And we yeah, I'm lucky enough that I still get to fly, and and uh, in fact, I was on that day that. On the anniversary, I was flying an F-15. The book club is back. We've got a modern classic this time, Tom Wolfe's The Right Stuff, one of my favorites. It, the book came out in 1979 and won the National Book Award. It was made into a movie, 
starring Ed Harris, Sam Shepard. And here with me are the book club regulars, Flora Lichtman, the multimedia editor, and uh, Annette Heist, our senior producer. Welcome. Hi, hi, Ira. Welcome. One of, one of the reasons I love this book so much is because I actually met the man with the right stuff, uh, General Chuck Yeager, years ago and spent time with him when the first shuttle launch. Yes, uh, I've like, heard. <laughs> <laughs> and I understand the general is on the line with us right uh, now. Wh- was that on the first shuttle landing on the leg bed out there? It sure was. Remember that? I co- remember that very much. Uh, you all were hyping about how how great it was to land on a lake bed. And I said, hell, we've been landing on this lake bed for 50 years. <laughs> there we were in our little card table. And I remember the... So I, I, I remember the uh, Secretary of the Air Force driving by to shake hands with you, and we had a great time. Yeah, yeah, it was fun. What, what, let's, talk about the, let's talk about what has happened in, in those years um, and, and about the right stuff. How, how, how much did the book get, get you as a real person, your personality and who you are? Did yeah, they... I, I think it did, it did a good job the, when, uh, when they re- re- wrote the book. You know that, that clarified a lot of stuff that came out in the movie, and uh, it 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 was fun uh, doing it. And I think, uh, like Sam Shepard, he was a perfect guy to to portray me. Uh huh. It, it worked out pretty good. How do you how do you define the right stuff? What does that term mean to you? Uh, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> That answer your question. I guess if you have the right stuff, that term means nothing. Well, basically. Uh, that's just a, you know, basically a, a, a phrase that Tom Wolfe coined that sold books, and that's about as simple as you can put it. Mm-hmm. It's it's uh, 65 years this year since you broke the sound barrier. Boy, that time must fl- have flown by very quickly for you. Yeah, it was. Uh, I did uh, on exactly on the anniversary. Uh, I uh, went over to Nellis Air Force Base in Las Vegas and borrowed a, an F-15 from them and came back to Edwards and boomed the place and, uh, to commemorate uh, the anniversary. So I still fly quite a bit. General Yeager, this is Annette Heist. I'm um, senior producer for Science Friday, and I want to ask you about a part in the book. Tom Wolfe describes how every airline pilot in America sounds the same when they come over the intercom, when you're sitting on the plane, a particular draw, a particular folksiness. And he says that they've all gotten that voice from you. Is that true? Well, I, I don't know. Tom Wolf says it is. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> no, it's basically a lot of guys, a lot of the pilots out there at Edwards, test pilots mainly, kind of pick up the down-home phrase, you know, like the odds raised at Sephora Pahar, they had to pipe daylight to me in West Virginia. <laughs> so uh, I, I don't have, I don't, I don't, Speak the king's language very good. What What do you think about uh, the the way pilots don't fly planes these days? I mean, we now have drones. We, they're, they're not the pilots sit oh, at joysticks. Hey, that, that's technology. You know, 50, 60 years ago, we just used fifty caliber bullets. Like I, like I flew Mustangs in World War II against the Germans, and uh, basically, we it's it, it's it's a it's a matter of progress and. Uh, Today, uh, uh, everything is done in airplanes is done with missiles, and uh, it takes takes all the training away and makes it pretty easy to shoot a guy down in front of you. Hmm. Our number is one eight hundred nine eight nine eight two five five. We're talking about uh, Tom Wolfe's book on our book club, uh, The Right Stuff, and we're talking about the man who is uh, the star of the of the Right Stuff, uh, General Chuck Yeager. What uh, are you going to continue to fly, General? And keep going on and continue to fly or do you think of retiring anytime soon uh no i i uh i still fly uh and uh, i'll be here in another couple of months i'll be 90 years old but uh, basically i don't have any problem passing the physical so how much time did uh tom will spend with you for this book how much time did tom will spend with you for the book hey, tom quite a bit really uh when we got into the technical stuff we're where I was had an accident uh, spinning an airplane in and bailing out of it, it was hard to make him understand really what you have to go through to to bail out of an airplane. And he he's he's not a technical guy, but he's a very good writer. 
Yeah, that part appears. I think it's the last chapter. He closes the book with that amazing scene. It sounds it was. terrifying. I knew you were coming on today, so I knew I knew what happened. That you're obviously alive, but my heart was pounding. Well, basically, uh, you got to expect things like that. I bailed out uh, three times now. I got shot down, and uh, then had uh, re had a problem when I re-entered the atmosphere above a hundred thousand feet with the 